Right. right. Um, we're, we're back. back. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all our amazing guests once again for their fascinating talks this evening. Uh, now we're going to have a short Q&A session. Uh, I'm going to pass you over to my colleague, Safia, who's going to get your questions from the audience. Safia, take it away. Thanks, you know. Uh, first, thanks everyone for your fantastic talks. It was amazing. Uh, the first question I have from the audience, um, I think is a quite a general question to so anyone who wants to uh, reply. So the question is from Ruth, and Ruth is asking, why are the majority of brands investing in this, this space luxury? Does this reflect the ambition slash innovation or the target market at all rich for the average fashion consumer who is also a gamer? Yeah, yes, Caitlin, it seems like a... <laughs> <what's your> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm happy to kind of do a start on that one. I'd love, I'd love to get other people's opinions on it too, too. those of you who kind of work in the real world in fashion space. So from my experience, number one, a lot of what we might see kind of um, publicly talked about, especially in the fashion press, is all these big things that are coming out from the mass luxury brands. Like we all know about the Palette Town Fortnite collaboration or the you know North Face Gucci uh, in Pokemon Go. But the thing is, actually, there's like so much ground roots like fashion creativity and fashion going into games that might just not be reported on as much, or it's just um, um, it's, it's kind of less of a like, sexy headline. headline. <laughs> you might not know about it so much. Like, like I, was I was looking into recently, like people that start their whole own like brands of clothes in The, the Sims, Sims and then sell them to other players in The Sims. Sims. That's, That's like, like a whole kind of market in there. <laughs> Um, and, and I think, think there is, uh, you know, there is a big section of that where, where like the luxury fashion industry is trying to evolve in a lot of ways and like keep up to date with like what, what is modern technology, technology and, and like what is going to be the next big thing that kind of keeps them engaged uh, with their audience. audience. But in the same way, I think it's, yeah, that mix of, um, you know, these luxury brands kind of have a bit of money to play around <laughs> and, and throw these things. things. Um, but also, also there, there are other things, things going on. You might just have to dig a little bit more to actually find them. So there's there's amazing collaborations that are going on at all different levels of kind of in fashion, fashion all the way through to luxury. Well, well, thank you for this uh, fantastic uh, answer, answer, Kathleen. Um, so now I have uh, also a question. question. I actually have one, one question for each of the <laughs> each of the talks. So I'm going to start with uh, Kira. So Kira, uh, the question that we have is: uh, Can you tell us anything about fashion choices for characters in the Wagyu Chronicles? I, have you been involved with it at all? Hello, hi. Um, I haven't been involved with the process, but um, I know that you know, game design and you know, just in design in general, a lot of the thought process just goes into where your fabrics are, how they move, how they rest on the body. Um, it might be a topic that's overlooked sometimes in games, but I know that for a majority, and we also with how game engines are improving um, literally every year, we're able to reach new milestones and new standards and how fabric can look. Uh, in engines, um, so I haven't had um, the chance to work with that with my team, but um, yeah, it's something that uh, we are working on, and um, we're, it's something that I hope to see a lot in upcoming games in the future and now, um, just more thought process in how fabrics can look and be imitated in the virtual space. Well, that, that sounds, sounds great. great. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks for your reply. And talking, talking about fabrics and games, I think it's a uh, <laughs> makes sense now to ask a question from Mia. Yeah, the question is, um, so uh, clothes simulation seems very technical and difficult. Can you tell us a bit more about your learning journey? Um, basically, um, I was studying at a national film and television school with my major in visual effects. So at that time, I already started to learn like uh, Maya, and also, also teach, I taught myself with Houdini and stuff. And, and actually, in Houdini, they have a really good system, like a vellum closing system, that you can create all kinds of different fabric um, simulation. But then I realized, marvelous designer, that they can do more creative work about closing, more complicated stuff. So when I wanted to do like Hanfu or like Qi Pao, those kind of traditional Chinese closing, I realized marvelous designer is the right way to do and, and animations are mostly from Mixamo, and 
that's, that's how you get, get like free, free rates. rates. So, so it's, it's easier for you to animate, animate it. it. And, and then, then simulate it in marvelous design. design. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's a lot of great information. information. I'm, I'm sure, sure that, that anyone that, that is interested in the in the simulation, simulation could look into that and hopefully uh, uh, learn, learn from your experience. So now I have a question for... Um, I have, I have a, a question, question for Jenny. Jenny. So uh, it's, it's a, a question, question about your um, your, your process. process. Uh, which <laughs> process do you enjoy better, physical or digital, digital something, something? And how comparable are they? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I guess because um, I'm a kind of focused on network, the differences between physical and digital sampling are like quite extreme. I guess because when you're doing physical sampling, if you're not using any digital tools, you need to do all your network pattern calculations by hand. So that's a lot of like writing out maths and working out ratios between how many stitches and how many rows you're knitting. Thinking about things like shrinkage. Um, so that when you wash it, it shrinks and different fibers are shrink by um, different kind of percentages, so you have to bear all that in mind when you develop a product. And um, obviously in digital sampling, you have like, you can sort of set the like, parameters and set presets for all that, so you can input how many stitches per centimeter, how many rows per centimeter, and like click a button and you've got your pattern calculations there. So it's much quicker. Um, I've also, also like, like from the working, working industry, it's, it's also much easier to work collaboratively digitally. So um, quite often when I was developing products for brands and kind of luxury, luxury brands, they would work with a supplier in Scotland, Scotland say, but they would also maybe have network factories in Italy, in, Italy, in uh, France, in Monaco. And quite often what happens is that if an order is too big and one factory can't fulfill it, the files would be shared between factories in the same luxury family. So, um, like one big brand tends to own or work with a set number of factories. And if you've got the files digitally, then it's very easy to kind of pass them over and for some of the production to be done elsewhere. If you're working just physically, then they have to then receive a garment and a reverse engineer it to work out how they're going to make it. So, Kind of physical, digital sampling is like hugely different in the kind of network world and then definitely quicker digitally. Well, that, oh, that sounds, sounds very interesting. interesting. I really yeah, like how you explain that, that it makes it so much easier for collaboration as well. well. That's uh, uh, on, on top, of course, of the sustainability aspect that, that you talked about in your talk. talk. Well, well, thank, thank you, you for your answer. Um, um, now I have a question for Ashley. So the question for Ashley is, um, did you ever make Shigurumi or video game characters to bridge even further the gap between your game art skills and cosplay skills? So, um, that's an interesting, that's an interesting that's thought, thought, actually. So, so because, because I was an environment artist, artist, I wasn't a character artist. artist. I was hired to do uh, scenery, landscape, houses, props. Uh, no, I didn't, I didn't touch, touch any people at first. Uh, that, that sounds, sounds wrong, wrong. Get what I mean. <laughs> um, I knew that I loved creating characters on, in a different way. Like, I love, I'm interested in makeup, I'm interested in drawing people. I've always liked drawing people more than trees, for example, but it, um, it wasn't my specialization in my job, it still isn't. Uh, so, no, I've not made Kirumi for uh, game characters, but uh, I could see how it could easily be done. I know there's a company uh, that I mentioned in my video called King Mask, and they have recently made a small scale printed um, Kigurumi mask to go on dolls. So that your doll can have this mask that can go on them. So imagine a Barbie doll having um, a Kigurumi mask on, so it changes their head like that, you know? And I think that's really cool. I think that they're thinking out of the box with that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, so I think it would be really cool, but ultimately not necessary because um, 3D characters' heads are basically exactly the same as a Kigurumi head, just sliced and shelled and prepped for printing, so you could sculpt a 3D character, slice their head off, and make a mask out of it, like, really quickly if you wanted to, if you know what you're doing. Um, so I think that prospect is more interesting. Like, I'd love to see you know, video game characters like Nintendo going, ah, oh, make a mask of Princess Peach, you know what I mean? I think that's really cool. 
Thanks for your play. It's even more impressive that you were an environmental artist before and now you're just sculpting uh, the face mask. So that's, <laughs> that's really interesting. Thanks. Um, I have a new question from the um, uh, from the audience, from the chat, from Eilich. Eilich is asking, um, I guess this is more a question for me, yeah, but maybe other oh, guests will be able to answer as well. If you're a content beginner and want to get into 3D clothes simulation, what are the best programs? Um, what are the best programs uh, to begin with? Sorry, <laughs> what are the best programs? Example, Maya, Udini, etc. What's best for, particu for particularly for self-initiated learners? Um, I say um, the easier the easy way to do is definitely learn a tiny bit about Maya because Maya is a software with a lot of pipeline in it, like animation, like modeling, like everything. You can start from there. Or, uh, but if you just want to do closing instead of animation or anything else, you can start with Marvelous Designer or, like you mentioned, the Close 3D. That's a good starting point, I think. Houdini is a bit complicated because it's very, it uses uh, Python and also a little bit of coding. If you your logic is perfect, you should try it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, hi, Chip. you're self-initiated kind of learning by yourself you could just follow like we'll have like beginners part one part two like all these playlists on youtube so that's quite a good place to start um if you want to go down the clo route yeah i watched a lot of clo um youtube videos actually so that i can know how to do it in marvelous designer yeah they're, they're super similar i think so yeah there's a lot of crossover well, that sounds good. I'm glad to see that we're all using YouTube to learn new skills. I uh, say we've got time for one more question. Well, that's great because I have one more question, and this awesome. is a question for Alexandra. So, Alexandra, uh, was the team inspired by existing brands of fashion designer for the character's fashion style? Um, so the characters are kind of designed based on several different references of various kinds. Um, so oftentimes we'll have, like for a specific character, we'll have just like, um, it almost looks like a mood board sort of thing where you have the character, um, we have some like basic narrative information. So for example, for Valeria, she's, um, like a, she's like an artist and she's she was originally supposed to be Russian. I don't think she is anymore. Um, so we had all these different, like a, a lot of times from Instagram, we take things like just fashion Instagram. And you know, we like the the vest was from an art artist. So we're like, okay, the artist has to have a vest and then whatnot. So it's like very much less of like brands and more of just like the feeling that clothes give and sometimes that's inspired by a particular picture or a celebrity. Um, no one character is a specific celebrity, but if, if you saw like, we maybe have three celebrities and we mash them together um, and that's the character. So yeah. Well, thanks for your reply. I hope you will inspire other um, aspect designers that are looking for inspiration for their characters. Well, thanks for everyone for taking the time to answer all these questions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. you.